Yeah, that's correct. And it's about uh, farm works, sensor technologies for modern animal farming. Um, and just uh, one note, uh, we will record this uh, presentation uh, for people who um, cannot join. We'll start the recording. Well, of course, yours. A uh, very good afternoon to everyone. First of all, thank you so much for making time to attend this uh, talk in spite of your busy schedule. Wish you a very happy, joyful and productive 2021. So where are we right now? How the society is moving in the midst of this transition from the pandemic last year to this 2021? So what we have gone through and what we will be going through uh, is, I would probably classify it as UCA world. UCA stands for volatile, uncertainty, complex and ambiguous. In any scenario, not necessarily related to um, the uh, a pandemic, but even a classroom setting when we take into a context, these all four different aspects are always omnipresent either home life situation or any scenario. It becomes even more complex in the uh, farming world. I also want to draw your attention to a unique formula, P is equal to G plus E. Uh, many of the PhD students and researchers can easily resonate with this particular formula. Phenotype is a combination of genetic and environment. So if we can understand the environment and the factors that has contributed in the genetic development, then we may have a certain say in terms of the phenotype. For example, uh, you can see the difference here in terms of the color of the dark pinkish flamingo versus the uh, one uh, slowly becoming an adult. So the pigments from the algae in their diet that turn them pink. So there are a, a wide variety of contexts we could understand by simply exploring this formula using sensing approaches and sensing technologies. So it's nothing new, uh, sensor technology. We, uh, there are uh, more than 20, 25 different types of sensors right now in your hand, in each and every one of your hand, in the mobile phones. You already use facial recognition tools to be able to log into your laptop or to your uh, smart mobile phones. But what are the key drivers? What is it that, that makes us to want to adopt and embrace sensing technology in animal farming? Uh, when you take into account a typical lay person who goes into a supermarket to buy a particular product, either a cheese or a dairy milk or meat product, nowadays, the most emphasis comes in the aspect of the society. What is the social impact of this particular product? Where does this particular milk come from? Is it from Daisy the cow uh, in this particular form on that particular day? So there is a more information seeking behavior. The ethical analysis understanding from the consumer is driving the aspects. Of course, there is a price, taste, health and wellness, nutrition composition, safety, those are all being taken into account. But the shift in consciousness, people are more geared towards the social impact ethics, uh, the farm to the fork, logistics behind it is one of the key drivers. 
as with this pandemic and also with any other uh, uh, related health and behavior of animals, how do we always go from reactive to predictive? Can we be able to understand even before that particular incident happens through proactive tools, decision support mechanisms? So sensors and sensing technologies come in handy. The third aspect we could look at is one-dimensional to multi-dimensional. Sometimes we tend to see things from one particular aspect. What I do not know, I do not know. So how do I go about I do not know to I know, yes, I'm getting to know. This can be answered from one-dimensional to multi-dimensional aspect through enabling data that comes from a variety of hardware components and sensing tools. I'll walk you through a few of these examples uh, when I give some uh, a research past project so we would get better understand what are the latest trends and the key drivers. The last or the fourth aspect I would say is going from gross to subtle. So when I uh, say, for example, right now about 30, 35 participants here in this Zoom conference meeting attending the seminar, uh, based on the type of questions each of you ask, the pace with which there is a gap between the words, the pause, the blink of an eye, uh, the lagging and the latency in the data that's being communicated between the speaker and the receiver, these fine scale features can be easily quantified, assessed and analyzed, and we can understand the thinking behavior, thinking pattern of uh, you as a speaker, and we could probably categorize into certain uh, decision support tools. Similarly, a lot of things can be done for um, the uh, animal behavior and animal welfare applications using sensing tools. So as I said, uh, sensors are really not new, but there are more new ways to measure things. When I look at sensors in the modern animal farming, we can group them into multiple aspects, reproduction, welfare, health, immunology, energy metabolism, epidemiology, and behavioral physiology. We could potentially use sensors to measure the stress of the animal just from the hair. So right now, um, uh, we have to take vials of blood from these cows or pigs to understand the different hormonal changes, either cortisol or oxytocin. But if these stress indicating parameters are manifested on the hair surface, that itself is enough to tell whether the animal is going through stress or not. There are a lot of ways we could use sensors to measure parameters which were not possible before. Um, for example, a, a tattoo based patches, a textile sensors, sensors to measure cortisol. Uh, sensors we could measure based on the composition of the exhalation of these animals. So as a human being, I take in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide, so does animals. But it's not just the carbon dioxide that is coming out of these animals. Uh, there are components such as odor, volatile metabolites, whatever they have feed, they have taken and consumed, turn into different um, uh, composition odor metabolites, those can be pinpointed and we could create a biomarker signature and measure them in real time and assess the health status of these animals. Briefly, we will look few examples. So why? What is the need, ultimate uh, need for sensor technologies? Uh, right now, if we take an example of avian influenza that happens in poultry birds, uh, in bigger countries, typically the farms are maybe several hours drive away from the centralized laboratory. So somebody has to go uh, prick the bird, take vials and vials of blood, either oral swab and a little bit of feces, ship the samples to a centralized laboratory. So lots of samples is needed. There is a handling involved in terms of manhandling the poultry birds um, and the other animals. So can we be able to bring down this shipping time? Can we be able to 
bring the lab to the hands of the farmers, a point of care diagnostic on the farm, on the spot. So this has lots of advantages. Instead of taking vials and vials of blood, just a droplet of blood is more than enough to pinpoint what's happening with these animals. Um, also, uh, because of the reduction in the logistics and shipping, um, we can make timely uh, judgment. Um, the gold standard for determining avian influenza is PCR, obviously. We look at the cell surface proteins to understand uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase to uh, find out whether it's a low pathogenic or high pathogenic. We developed a couple of uh, tools, handheld uh, uh, platforms that has the ability to actually tell the results within a few minutes rather than waiting for six to eight hours going through the PCR-based analysis. The ability to differentiate these cell surface protein, how the binding happens on the spot in a very short time provides numerous advantages to a poultry sector. So how does this work? Very briefly, you know, when we go for a jog uh, from here to the dike in the south of the city, um, you know, once the jogging is finished, we feel thirsty. So you take a little sip of water. When the water goes inside the tongue and goes inside the um, digestive system, quenching happens. Each and every molecule of water that goes inside the human body starts the quenching process and then we feel fulfilled. Similar concept, we shine a light on the cell surface protein in the presence of a certain binding component such as antibodies or a specific biorecognition element. Based on the binding and the wavelength intensity, we can quantify how much of the high pathogenic versus low pathogenic components are present and we can actually decide, make the decision within a few minutes rather than several hours. These are some of the examples of the prototype we have de developed in the recent past. There are two approaches. One is a light-based approach. Second is the electrochemical-based approach. Change in the conductivity and the reactivity of the components can be translated into a specific measurable user-friendly signal. So at the end, a uh, user would simply see either a green tick mark or an X a red color that would indicate presence or absence. Sometimes we could also semi-quantifiably um, understand how much of those virus pathogens are present in just a droplet of blood in that particular moment. This is a wearable sensor. It's a, this was the inspiration we got for the sensor from um, the smart watches, obviously. We can measure heart rate. Um, and other related parameters, whether we are sleeping uh, or uh, what is the level alpha, beta, theta, delta level in terms of the uh, heart rate signal to the brain wave. So the idea here is we as a human being, we sweat a lot. When we excrete sweat through the skin, those are not just salt composition. We also exude uh, specific metabolites such as cortisol and lactate those are indirect indication of the stress level of human beings again uh, this technology was developed for biomedical human health application we also got some funding from gates foundation bill and melinda gates to do some work on jaundice detection for infant mortality in ghana and nepal but how do we translate this technology to uh, animals? Of course, uh, animals does not have a sweat glands, but the patches can be developed that can be put on the uh, snouts of the pigs or on specific body portion like a, uh, the reproductive organ related discharge or the nasal discharge of cows to understand what is being secreted from these animals. So some of these wearable sensors can actually help us to move from reactive to predictive through a proactive approach. When I take a swab on the tongue of an animal, even as a human being, we typically see more than four to seven different species or classes of bacteria. 
So this is very common problem in poultry and pig industry in terms of the cleanliness and sanitation when we take a swab on the handrail or different equipment that's being used we find multiple bacteria. Right now the technology can tell only one bacteria at a time preferably and primarily based on plating sometimes PCR based or ELISA based approaches. So what we developed is a handheld tool, it's a tiny little suitcase with a bunch of boxes and reagents and the brick-like equipment. We take it to the field, do the swabbing and know the results right away on the field and the uh, laptop or the phone associated to that instrument can give what are the different types of bacteria present uh, um, in that particular sample. It's more of a multi-species, multiplexing and understanding the compositional makeup of that particular analyte. It could be urine, it could be milk, it could be uh, different other species. So we extended this to determine progesterone detection in milk and also antibiotic residues in uh, dairy samples as well as in the blood samples of the uh, poultry birds. Here is an, another example. This is uh, um, maybe you might have seen or used a glucometer at home. Basically a small little handheld device, prick a finger, take a droplet of blood, put it on a little chip which is a, a, either a electrochemical strip or an uh, enzymatic strip and then you'd be know the results right away. Similar concept but it has a multiplexing approach. The idea here is we have the ability to determine metabolites such as um, metabolic disorders, non-esterified fatty acids and also subclinical ketosis markers such as beta-hydroxybutyrate to quantify and also semi-qualitatively assess the energy balance issues for dairy cattle. Right now the gold standard is obviously vials and vials of bloods are being drawn, shipped to the centralized laboratory. We do the testing to understand what's happening with these animals. But with the advent of these point of care microfluidic nanoflu uh, nanotechnology based sensing approaches, we can completely move away from the traditional system, then thereby save time, also enhance welfare of the animal use using these sensing tools. Just a, a, an example here. So the idea here, another challenge is how do we bring down the time to cost? It's fantastic. Right now they charge about 15 uh, euros per test uh, for either NIFA or BHBA, um, depending on the volume of the testing. But can we be able to bring down the test to one euro per test? So we wanted to address that question uh, by a combination of sensing approaches and sensing hardware. What you see here on the left bottom side is a 3D printed box. The top side you see a little glass slide with a microfluidic channel and a Canadian 25 cent coin. So by using this 3D printing and hardware electronic based approaches and also we bought some off the shelf Japanese based some filters to demonstrate that hey you know what we can actually build a device everything like 60 to 70 euros per device thereby we can bring the tests to less than one euro uh, per test so the device is permanently used it's more like a glucometer the strips of the gas uh, the glass light appearing device can be thrown out per test so that's the idea and we validated with samples collected from over 24 different farms in uh, southwestern uh, Ontario in Canada. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with mycobacterium paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease for dairy cows is the it takes about almost 12 to 16 weeks for the bacteria to incubate which means three to four months. So it's really too late by the time the farmers make a judgment call what to do with the animal, whether the animal has Yoni's disease or not, it's too late. You have to cull the animal, quite contagious, the calls and others also get. But how do we move from this reactive approach to a proactive by a predictive approach? So uh, there are certain components in the blood we call the microRNAs. They are 6 to 12 nucleotide sequences. They keep on circulating. They are, but it's quite challenging. It's, uh, they are only about 
um, a very low abundant. And uh, an analogy would be finding a needle in a haystack. How do we go and find those microRNAs in circulating blood cells to, which serves as a potential indicator of the occurrence of mycobacterium paratuberculosis? So we developed a technique called LAMP, loop-mediated isothermal amplification. Right now, uh, the ABOT diagnostics are uh, basically selling these home-based uh, instant COVID-19 testing that's exactly based on this LAMP technique, uh, loop-mediated uh, isothermal amplification. So we have the ability to build 8 to 12 different multiplexing. So we could screen almost 12 different markers all at the same time uh, within a few seconds using a combination of sensing methods, imaging, and assess. So the idea here is farmers, a non-technical person can simply go to the farm, take a little bit of feces or uh, prick the cockygeal veil of the cow, take a droplet of blood, put it in the chip, then screen. You know the results within a few minutes, either that the byproducts of paratuberculosis is present or not. Uh, we did a little bit of project uh, with human hospital in uh, predicting breast cancer biomarkers. Uh, Twelve different women were involved, pre-menopausal and post-menopausal women. We collected blood samples to understand. Uh, the goal is to, is it at all possible to predict the breast cancer um, rather than uh, you know, going through those mammogram every two years, which is really an invasive, unpleasant experience. So just by a droplet of blood, what are the things we could look at in terms of microRNA signatures? We developed a mechanism using a technique called Foster Resonance Energy Transfer, and then look for specific sandwiching mechanism, how these microRNAs um, connect with each other, how much of them is present in a high volume, high abundant, in a low abundant ratio. Uh, using a very, very super sensitive technique, 10 picomolar uh, concentrations we were able to identify. So this is more like a proof of concept. Although we have published this research with some of the clinicians, uh, it, this has more potential in the livestock area, especially microRNA in livestock is a very understudied uh, uh, research. So that's one of the current uh, projects we are currently looking at doing within the uh, ADP group uh, in exploring multiple aspects of how do we develop predictive diagnostic tools. Can we be able to stop the next pandemic, either avian influenza or Yoni's disease or um, any kind of livestock-based disease by these sensitive decision support uh, sensor-based technologies? So that's a bigger question we are trying to address through a variety of tools. Very quickly, you can see here some of these uh, hardware components uh, we have developed. We also uh, developed a uh, food allergen sensor. When you go on a Friday evening, perhaps not during this lockdown, after the vaccine is rolled out, when you have a really nice meal with your buddies, uh, how do you ensure that there is no allergen is present if one of your buddy has a specific allergen issue? There is absolutely no commercial tools. So we developed a piezo-resistive uh, sensing approach to find out a variety of uh, allergens. For example, peanut allergen, ARA H1 protein, lupin in egg, shrimp or shellfish, okadaic acid, so on and so forth. About 14 different allergens can be identified on the spot within a few minutes using handheld platforms like these. So the idea here is it's not just detection alone. There is a real-time transmission of data then and there you, uh, to, through the mobile app to the key decision-making authorities. If there is a food safety inspector or an animal caretaker or a veterinarian, they can have access to this data in real-time fashion because of the data transmitting capability of these hardwares. A paper-based microfluidic aptus sensor, it's just an example because in Canada we have um, um, a lot of native uh, uh, aboriginal folks. Sometimes the resources are very low. 
How do we enable technology for low resource settings for them? Can we be able to do a simple, no electricity based, instrumentless approaches so that they can at least check yes or no to understand specific viruses or bacteria or allergens? So that was the question that drive us to develop a few tools. Here is a paper based approach to check for specific allergen components in the uh, analytes. The same can be expanded by integrating with the uh, smartphones. Just a normal smartphone with a customized app can screen for the pictures depending on the intensity changes in terms of uh, how the absorption has happened on the paper-based sensor. We could screen for a variety of target analytes within a few minutes. So this was a well received uh, in some of the low resource settings. Um, there is also lots of commercialization potential for a variety of um, livestock applications as well. This is another example. I used to live in Japan for a couple of years. So the, in China also it's quite famous origami, playing with papers, creating new architectural designs, 3D fashion. So we got this idea from them, how we can use simple three-dimensional paper-based design as a sensing platform to look for different viruses and pathogens. Of course, we have to use nanomaterials, reagents, chemicals, but the design is a unique thing because just by folding the paper in multiple fashion, um, we could uh, solve a number of problems that were not solvable before uh, because of the unique cross-reactivity, specificity, sensitivity-related uh, sensor-based design issues. This is another example. In the glass slide at the bottom, you clearly see a little star with the six different wells. The idea here is, this is these are like a small, simple tattoo or a sticker or a patch. You put a little droplet on the middle, and then that droplet travels to those tiny little six wells on these different uh, uh, connected parts. So we could do screening of six different pathogens all at the same time as each of those wells were coated with the specific uh, sensing biorecognition coating. Then just by a color change, on the left side you see a gray and a green on the C. You can see, so it's a quantum dot and graphene-based approaches allows us to understand and bring down the time to results to fraction of second which used to take several hours. So the drive away from here is can we be able to develop a number of tools for currently occurring problems. Um, Coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 is not unique or not novel at all. It has been happening in poultry sector for quite some time. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have developed few handheld platform tools for avian coronaviruses in 2015, 16, and 17, about three years ago, uh, using just thread, a thread as in the textiles. The simple color change and the change in the form, shape, and the function of the thread can be relied as an indicator of presence or absence of these uh, viruses. So at the top, we can see some of the examples in how we demonstrated the detection of coronavirus in chicken blood samples using a fluorescent resonance energy transfer approach. So this is fine, fantastic, but what am I up to? I'm here in Wahanegan for the past two months as a new faculty within the uh, adaptation physiology group. Right now, as I said, there are three different projects we are looking at. One is how I can use microRNAs as a signature, as a predictive diagnostic biomarker for a variety of health and welfare related issues in livestock. Project one. Project two is uh, we have recently developed a facial recognition system for animals. So the idea here is can we be able to understand the emotional states of these animals, whether the cow is happy or the pig is aggressive or frustrated just by taking a picture. So we developed a Python-based, YOLO-based uh, platform, a tool that has the ability to understand and provide the information of the mental makeup, the emotional state. 
We can see here on the uh, right side the pig ears. Just look at the ears. They were upright. The second picture, the pig ears are to the back. The third one is kind of asymmetrical. One is kind of droopy, floppy. The other one is erect. The fourth one is sideways. So the posture of the ear, ears of these pigs and also how much eye white. Even for humans, you know, when we get surprised, our eyes become bigger. We see lots of eye white region. Similarly, these animals also express um, physiologically their emotions and mental states based on different facial features. But the biggest uh, challenge is we as humans has lots of facial muscles, tiny little wrinkles the po uh, um, below the eyes, even the upper and the lower lips, there is a pursing of lips happens. So, but these cues, these emotional expressions uh, has been studied only for the past few years. Uh, people have developed a grimace scale to understand what is the pain these animals go through. Can we be able to automate this? <clears throat> So from a very helicopter drone approach, the idea here is that every year United Nations a Human uh, a Development Index, based on that, they classify countries, which is the happiest country in the world. So typically these Scandinavian countries, they come top three, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Netherlands has been ranked five for the past few years. And then Canada, I think it was really four, but for the past few years, it's number seven and number eight in terms of happiness index. From the OIE perspective, um, organization for, it's similar to WHO uh, in terms of the animals. How do we develop a global standard in terms of establishing protocols for welfare? So every country has their own unique requirements, standards. There is also variation between species. Even if you take into account um, a dairy cows, Holstein versus other breeds. But how do we create a template? How do we move from a subjective to ob objective approach so that the specific standards can be developed? Something equal to a happiness index. So the um, animal safety inspector, they can basically walk into, uh, rather than spending only 45 minutes putting a tick mark or an X mark next to the questioner, they take into account a much more comprehensive um, approach in understanding the emotions, um, in understanding the welfare of the animals. When I say welfare, it's not just about reducing the pain, reducing the negative experiences, but also providing positive, happy, joyful um, experiences to these animals so that these animals can express their own unique uh, natural behavior in its own way. So how do we enable those? What are the standards we need? What are the protocols? What are the uh, tools? mechanisms we need. So these long set of questions can be addressed using sensing technologies. So automated facial recognition system has lots of advantages. The idea here is we are not going and pricking or taking blood samples, just a picture, non-invasive. So uh, it enables a lot of um, uh, welfare in terms of data collection methods. There is no, not even wearable sensors. So sometimes we could integrate machine vision with thermal camera to understand how the changes happen in terms of temperature on the snout region or the fine scale changes, gross to subtle level uh, under the eyelids or the nasal level. Pick those physiological function parameters, connect with the behavior, connect with the health status, create a model, data-based model, so that we can understand how these animals behave, function with respect to changing a variety of uh, composition and scenarios. We could also understand, uh, merge vocalization data. For example, a dairy cow, uh, when it's, um, the call is close, they make a specific sound. Especially when the dairy cows are grazing in large farms, when the call is out of sight, it starts making specific noise. We can understand the frequency, pitch, what is the wavelength with which that um, uh, um, vocalization is happening from the dairy cow, and we can make meaning out of it using these sensors. 
by combining the spatial recognition tool, vocalization data, non-invasive heart rate, skin conductance, measurement of variety of physiological functions, we can develop beautiful models predicting behaviors um, and a number of questions can be answer, answered using sensing tools. The, the third uh, focus for me immediately is uh, digital twin. So digital twin is more like a duplicate or a, um, of a digital duplicate or a digital replicate. This is quite, uh, um, I think in uh, plant side, uh, the plant science and food science, people are very uh, actively involved. I believe um, a little more uh, effort can be made from the animal science group to bring this technology, we could do plenty of research uh, in this area. There are a lot of untapped, unexplored area uh, in this research. Uh, I was born and brought up in India. First 20 years of my life was in India. The second, almost 23, 22 years in Canada. I'm here, I'm giving my age now. Uh, I'm right now in the third and fourth part of my life here in Dutch, okay? So there is a god called Indra, it's a mythological god, he's the god of heaven. The word Indra is an acronym for digital twins, individual. For example, when we develop a particular twin, it's only for a particular animal, it's not for her, herd or a group of animals. It's like just Daisy, John, Lotus, Daisy. So we can actually name, in, create the unique characteristics for those animals near real time. The decisions are made based on data informed, realistic and actionable. A number of problems can be solved. For example, in the emotion and the cognition area, we can actually predict how these animals are going to behave even before those incidents happen. Just, uh, uh, for example, tail biting and the feather picking are the biggest problems in the poultry and the pig industries. So we will be able to predict even before the tail biting is going to happen. The piglet is going to open its mouth and going to bite the uh, tail of the adjacent animal. We can quickly predict before that happen and certain changes can be made to avoid that particular incident using digital twin. There are uh, what if scenarios. For example, if a feed uh, company went bankrupt, but we have enough feed for two months. That feed company is producing a specific feed with a specific nutrition composition. What is the possibility of this lack of nutrition provision in two months down the road in a thousand animal uh, born? So is it going to change the physiology or immunology or metabolism? If that's the case, how it will be manifested in the phenotype in terms of the behavior? Uh, so those kind of scenarios can be uh, manipulated, played, adjusted and understood and investigated using digital twins. So we are looking at how do we go about developing these. We are doing a very small scale baby steps right now in developing certain algorithms to understand um, the emotional expression in an automated fashion uh, based on a variety of uh, big data uh, in this area. So that's another example, uh, research focus we are currently interested in. So quickly uh, wrapping up. So what is it that the sensor technology can provide uh, to the modern animal farming? Multitude of data. It's not just only one approach, one dimensional. We take into account a variety of signals, uh, facial expression, vocalization, activity whether the animal is sitting, lying, uh, uh, making steps. What is it that, that coming out of the breath or the nasal discharge, uh, how the heart rate of the animals changes? All of these can be put together in a non-invasive manner to understand the animal. So uh, lots of data analysis. Once the data is being collected, then we create critical insights about these animals, not from the animal perspective, but also from the perspective of how these animals talk to each other. What is their social network analysis? How do they interact with the environment? How do they perceive things? Um, both from the welfare perspective and also from the production perspective. So lots of policy related uh, uh, assessment can be done based on the results uh, using the sensor enabled data analysis and sensor approaches in solving problems in animal farming. 
think with this I'd like to uh, conclude and say thank you a lot for listening to me and open for questions now. Well, thank you for this uh, presentation. And uh, like you said, we have a couple of minutes left for questions. So if there's anyone, um, please raise your hand. Bas. Thank you, Suresh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering about your uh, project idea for the, the pigs and the cows, eh, for the emotion, emotion detection and the face, uh, the face reading. Uh, do you also see scope for that under commercial conditions, or do you re really need uh, a research environment where you can collect very good image data? So we are in the we just uh, in the process of submitting the journal uh, bus. We have done some seed work to demonstrate that the software is capable of providing about, uh, for ex uh, based on the eye white region and the ear posture of both the cow and the pig, we can say um, uh, the mental makeup. So we collected about almost 2,500 2, images from eight different farms in North America, uh, or one farm in India and one farm in Australia. Uh, to do uh, training of the model we developed. We used OLO, we used um, Python-based algorithm. So, but that's not just enough, it's just a baby step. For example, there is a Chinese company, they claim um, they have automated system and I approached them and wanted to try it out. The several futures were uh, they are they were in Chinese, I couldn't understand uh, what it's all about. Uh, it's hard for me to translate also and also the effic eff efficiency of classification typically 85 and above is acceptable they were giving only 60 55 percentage so it's really really low percentage um, so so number one is what is the consensus among the research community scientists in terms of hey this is what exactly the uh, retreat from uh, aggression if the pigs are basically after the tail biting happened they retreat how the ear posture. Is it a commonly accepted consensus? Um, we just rely on only the past uh, almost eight to 10 years of literature, a uh, uh, whole range of comprehensive data published out there and use that information to build the software. So if the consensus changes, there is a need for change in the uh, software algorithm, number one. Number two, only a couple of futures we are taking into account. We are not, so compounded expression versus single expression. So what we are looking at is just a single expression. As you all are already aware, even the wagging of the tail of the pig can mean a positive or a negative mental state. It could mean both. But if there is a loop in the um, pig, uh, the tail, then which means pig is happy. So we need to... Uh, Combine that tail position with the ear posture, with the eye, and perhaps with the heart rate to get a compounded emotional expression state. We cannot just make uh, only a couple of futures and make S. Yes, this is what it is. So there are a lot of um, aspects, multidimensional uh, data that need to be put into to develop a holistic uh, software. But we have to start somewhere. We have started already. Um, so that's where we are at right now. I hope I addressed your question, uh, Bas. Thank you. Very good. Yeah.